as well. And I'm joined uh, by, uh, so Avni is joining in, Arpita is here. I think that's Sabina who is logging in. So let me introduce you to the Online Money Book Club. It's a platform that's been initiated by Women on Wealth. And Women on Wealth is a women-centric community where we help women uh, to learn about finance, provide them the financial tools and trainings, teach them how to use this so that they are able to, uh, with confidence, take charge of their finances. And inside of that, the Online Money Book Club has been running for the past, uh, I think it's over two and a half years now, uh, started with the intention of helping you know, the financial knowledge accessible to more women. I think book is an easy way. I think it's a private way as well to, you know, you can just um, sneak yourself in a corner, sit with a money book. And even if people, you don't want people to know you're learning about finance, you, know, you can easily do that. And uh, in the money book club, we read books on personal finance, investing habit and mindset building. We have read a ton of books. And just like that, we've also picked this amazing book titled The Financial Diet. And uh, today we shall be really looking back. And uh, last week we talk, took on reading chapter five, which is on home. And, um, you know, uh, just talking about what are some insights for people who had been, have been reading this book? What are some insights that we have drawn uh, from this particular chapter and then what we do is after we discuss on the uh, shared insights, we then read a new chapter. So we will move on to the sixth chapter together today. We'll do some reading and further more discussion. Okay. And some highlights that I've brought for the community from chapter five are one, every woman's toolkit. Um, and it is you know, it's not something even I expected to read in a money book, but we will discuss more around it. Every woman's toolkit, then buying only what you truly love will make your house feel like home. So as we're talking about home, how do you make your house a home? What are the financials involved, you know? Or is there a, a money saving way but you know where you uh, use what you know to create a beautiful space for yourself without spending a lot of money. We'll talk about all of those things, um, and then we we will. There's also a key question in the book: How do you know if you're financially ready to buy a house? So uh, I am now going to welcome everybody. Warm welcome, everyone, and uh, let's begin with discussing chapter five. How many of you? reached that chapter, read that chapter, and you know what did you think of that chapter? So inviting everyone to switch on your cameras. Uh, that'll be great to see your faces. And anyone who's been reading this book and got to this chapter? Confession, I haven't got past chapter one. <laughs> I'm just listening today. I'm getting back to this book only now. I am not sure how much of listening you'll be able to do. Just listening. <laughs> I'm sure, you know, from your life experience, like you said in the Telegram book club, uh, you know, for anybody who's watching us live and would want to join the book club on Telegram, then the link is in the description of this video. And uh, in the Telegram group, we were talking about how many of us are really into DIYs, right? When it comes to setting up our house, uh, decorating our homes. And uh, because for me personally, any item that I can think of now, I feel that maybe I had tried some bit of DIYs in the past, but looking at how many items one has to first assemble, I feel maybe it's just maybe it's cheaper in terms of even time consumption to maybe go pick it up so I have become that kind of a person either I will not want that item you know um and many of my I yeah I don't decorate decorate my house so much uh, otherwise I think I only uh, mostly at this point assess from how much time input is required uh, then either the item is coming home or 
it doesn't come home. But what about you guys? Are you guys into DIYs? How do you save money in making your homes beautiful? I guess, yeah, I am a DIY person and I don't like to buy a lot of stuff. I like free space around me, so I buy very best. When I need something, then only I buy and it's a natural thing. So I didn't have to do or practice it consciously. It just happens that way for me. And definitely DIY because it feels more of your own thing when you make something on where you, where you gather something and make something useful out of it rather than just throwing it out so that way it naturally i prefer that at my home yeah. thanks arpita for sharing what are someone's joining the one plus 60 please share who you are so i'm not diy because i'm price conscious or because i don't want to spend that but it's just that i love working with my hands and i am a craftsperson and i do make things so from ceramics, I mean, mugs and plates and bowls that I use are all made by me. So also, even during the pandemic, the masks were all made by me. So I make for my whole family, like different, different ones. In fact, right now I'm sitting at the sewing machine. So it's just, I have to make everything, whether it's carpentry or it's making something with a wood or with ceramics. It's just, it's something that I have a constant urge to do. So a lot of that goes into the house is usually something that was meant for something else. And I revamp it to me, become something which I need. Mm. So I don't really decorate because more surfaces just mean more things to gather dust, more ways to have things to clean. So less things better. But that said, I have been hoarding because I don't want to put it in the landfill. I keep it all in my house. <laughs> That's also there. <laughs> yeah. And then, you know, um, I have, of course, been thinking of, and I think, yeah, I'm just not that kind of a person who would buy such items because I had it's just now that I am getting into all of that it's okay let me jazz up my space a little bit and all that um, but partly from reading this book as well I think just this morning I was running this idea that uh, yeah, you know behind my bed the headboard you know behind I would like to maybe add a little panel and maybe have some uh, frames go there uh, you know, this was inspired by something I saw at someone else's house. And then I've been thinking, okay, first I went from, I need to uh, call a carpenter. Uh, then I'm thinking, hey, can I really do it myself? <laughs> Number then the third option is maybe I can engage my brother-in-law to really work with me, they do a weekend project. All I have to do is at this point, maybe, you know, just uh, get a small a, a thin piece of wood something I don't know again you know so those are things because I want to do it but for that particular work to have a carpenter come and all of that um, you know is so maybe the book is inspiring me to take some things and then um, do it so so yeah that's just about enough DIYs I do I think around my house <laughs> Okay. Having a carpenter come, you're still making use of your idea and getting them executed is okay. It's just yeah. going and buying something from Ikea or buying something from off the shelf. Then you're just getting something ready-made to fit in there. Then that's not really, you know, it's not a personal touch. As long yeah. as it's your design and you're executing it through a carpenter, it's a skill. So it's still a sort of very personalized thing. Mm. I think that's not quite buying it off the shelf. Yes, yes, yeah. Thank you so much for that supportive statement, Kaveri. Um, okay, and talking of carpentry and all of that, the book also has introduced us to uh, a toolkit. So, how many of I want to really, I wanted to really ask you know how many of us really use or keep these toolkits? I think most homes have them, right? Uh, but how many of us know how to use them? And uh, do we often use them? So in the meantime, I'll also share for everybody else who's not read the book, I can share the list of two tools uh, that uh, the author has put together that everyone must have in case so we can do the small things ourselves and not having to call an expert all the time where we do then end up spending money. So that was a whole intention. So 
please share while I get that list out for everyone. Um, and also, I think the other question is, do we know these tools? Okay. Um, so something, so Chelsea's mom's toolkit, every woman needs in her home. One is hammer with a claw. Hammer with claw. I know hammer with claw. claw. Next is one in one screwdriver. Yes. Yes. Handheld saw and, and meter, meter box. Uh, I know handheld saw. I don't know meter box. What is that? Then, oh, yeah. Then there's a level, aka spirit level or bubble level. I have seen it. I've seen others uh, experts use, professionals use it, um, but never have. Some of you have two in the house because we don't share. Uh -huh. <laughs> Then there's a slip joint pliers. I know pliers use them, but I don't know. But I don't know how a, what a slip joint plier looks like. It's where, where the thing is adjustable. It's not a fixed thing. You can slip the joint yeah. to adjust the, uh, the you know the um, the size can be adjusted according to that. The, the cross part is adjustable. Then there's yeah. a needle, needle nose pliers, guys. If you want to add yeah. to your toolkit, needle nose pliers. Then there's a tape measure, which I think uh, most of us are familiar with and have it around the house. Um, a cordless drill. So a drilling machine I've seen, but... Um, no, I, I have a corded drill, not cordless. Yeah. So it needs to be yeah. plugged in with different drill bits. So corded one, Black & Decker best. <laughs> For this drills, okay. Various screws, picture hangers, and nails. Yes, have seen them around. Um, scissors, of course. Masking tape and painter's tape. Okay, so these are some uh, items to have in the toolkit. That's what she shared. And then some basic things you should know how to do change a light bulb, fix a toilet lever, use a power drill, unclog a drain, replace a light switch, tighten a leaky pipe or faucet, find a stud, fix a drywall hole, assemble IKEA furniture. And YouTube is your friend to learn anything and everything. Okay. We can adjust this for Indians. Because we yeah. don't have so much drywall here. We don't need to know how to do a drywall. But you will need to know how to use M-Seal and waterproof M-Seal. And you need to also, over here, have a set of Allen keys. Different sized Allen keys, which are there, must have. Just okay. things which you need for India. I don't know what the last item is. <laughs> so see? Yeah. Yes. Wait, I can show you in a bit. Uh, I can Great. Hi, Preeti. Warm welcome. You know, I have uh, I have another thought on this DIY. See, all this DIY is absolutely essential if you're living outside India. Mainly because any professional, if you get, if you want some, say, plumbing or carpentry or electricians, first of all, it is very expensive. And secondly, they're not that easily, you can't come by them that easily. So very often you might get a plumber after three days or four weeks or so. In India, that is not the situation. Uh, so I feel that of course, if you're just killing yourself, that's fine. But if we are in a way, we provide employment to those people because the, the you know, the, these uh, trade, uh, uh, plumbers, carpenters, uh, electricians, because without our support, they would not be able to earn a living. In the Western world, in the developed world, people who follow these trades, they are, they are able to have an extremely good standard of living. So I feel that these skills are not as relevant to us, but of course, simple yeah. things, changing a light bulb or fixing a switch 
that definitely because it's an emergency you need to do it so that is but these you know more skillful things uh, you might not need them as frequently depending of course on where you stay if these mm. people are available to you or not mm. that's a beautiful way to two minutes i can just show you this is a slip joint plier so you can slip the joint to make it wider or narrower this is a slip joint plier this is the nose plier it has a sharp nose here so yeah. this is a nose plier for i can use of course um, sorry spanners in every conceivable size you have to have <laughs> and oops the allen keys i was talking about are these so they have a little head and they're in different sizes they're called allen keys and so they go into the bolt so they usually those allen key bolts are sunk in so for you to be able to undo it so you get it on a ring you get different sizes so these are essentials you need to have thank you for uh, showing them as well thank you so much um now uh, some other some something else that uh, chelsea has highlighted in the book is uh, a lot of us dream of buying a property of our own you know having a house um how do you know if you're financially ready to buy i, I think it's a very important question um because a lot of us may a lot of us say it uh but unless we're financially prepared uh we can't really go in and have you know and always always being ready for it and looking and preparing and it i think it takes years to even prepare you know it's not something like you think now and then next year okay i'm i'm going to buy a house uh it takes years of putting that money together so i would like to share for everybody and then uh, you know we discuss so let me get the questions that she's shared in the book maybe it's worth looking at it okay and i'll share it on the screen okay let's read it together so inviting okay maybe preeti can read it preeti okay okay this how do you know if you're financially ready to buy okay yeah how do you know if you're financially ready to buy uh there is no right time to buy but there are financial risks that you are or are not comfortable taking your current financial position has a bearing on your ability to buy today but ultimately how much money you put down where you buy what you buy home condo townhouse etc are all decisions that depend on what your financial state needs to be in the future to sustain that purchase and whether that is feasible buying the house is actually the easy part you can do it with 3.5% down only 3.5% of the actual cost of the house the unknown future expenses lifestyle and economic changes should factor into your decision making process the risks you face in purchasing a house are well documented after the housing crisis and should be considered spending below your means applies just as much to home buying as it does to say using credit cards additionally many expenses exist that are tied to each individual's unique capabilities as a home owner okay the questions you should ask yourself when considering buying a house are how long could you make payments without your job what happens if your property taxes increase how soon do you want to sell your home are you comfortable taking a loan to sell if necessary are you prepared to cover unknown large expenses in the future roof furnace air conditioning will you have to pay service providers to perform common tasks there are many variables and financial risks in the way people live and their corresponding housing market across america research your area and become knowledgeable about all the variables monetize these variables and make educated 
you have to scroll up scroll down yeah mm -hmm. decisions as to when you are truly ready to buy and what your financial situation should look like now and into the future the following are general financial principles that all home buyers should consider income stability it's generally advisable to have be at the same job or at least in the same industry for at least 2 years would it hypothetically be easy for you to find another job savings the minimum required down payment for a house is 3.5% but the more you can give up front the more favorable your mortgage uh, terms you should also have savings that will cover unforeseen expenses prove your ability and discipline to save money third is credit strive for a credit score in the good range 700 plus and you will gain access to the best mortgage rates if you are stretched so thin that you are forced to make purchases on your credit card and can't pay it off at the end of the month you might reconsider buying a home until expenses are controlled uh, in many area uh, in many areas across the country your mortgage will cost less than rent that is the bonus that she has said is bonus to buying a house uh, what are things someone sorry 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 where am i excuse me uh, yeah sorry <laughs> i just uh, yeah what are some things someone should look for uh, in a mortgage deciding where to shop for a mortgage and whose advice to trust can be intimidating my best advice is to shop around with a few different lenders local and national banks and credit unions if you belong to one find someone you trust with low fixed rates and reasonable fees don't be tricked by low introductory slash adjustable rates or rates that are well below the competition the phrase too good to be true is uh, is important in a business as complex as mortgages yeah you'll have to scroll up again Yeah, the text is broken into half here. Can you okay. make sense? Uh, okay. Uh -huh. I think the first yeah. one says finding the place you love, renting or buying it is the easiest way possible. Ah, uh, and living in it with know how and care for the for the things you own is one of the biggest steps to getting control over your budget and your future. living costs are the biggest portion of our budgets usually and represent so much about how we prioritize our money it's not scary or hard to get good at this stuff and it's liberating we shouldn't be oversized kids playing house in the places we live we should be the kind of grown ups who have tool kits and five year plans who aren't completely thrown off by every minor problem having control over how we live feels good trust me i think that's the end of the chapter on home okay okay so we'll pause here okay so let's hear from everyone any questions thoughts comments on what we just read and people with home buying experiences definitely give some tips from your life experience anyone anyone looking at buying a property okay nobody is looking at buying a property okay good <laughs> all right then we are good awesome So then, let's uh, continue reading and uh, let's get into chapter six. It's an interesting topic again, love, and I want to see what's there. This book has really surprised us. So, inviting one of you to please volunteer to read for the community while I uh, share the book on the screen. I think this chapter will be really interesting. I have an idea, perhaps, of what it might. B, what the chapter might be about? I I I would I can't read. I'm on the phone, so it's really small. 
Okay. Yeah. Let me share. Okay. I can read. So let me read for my community. Chapter six. How, anytime you'd like me to stop so that we can discuss, then please let me know. Okay. Chapter six, how to be a Miranda, not a carry. Okay. There's nothing more cringeworthy than having a relationship, but uh, then having a relationship be your financial plan. Let me read that again. Yeah. There's nothing more cringeworthy than having a relationship be your financial plan. It's a safe, if not too conservative estimate to say that since the age of 16, I have watched each episode of Sex in the City about 15 times. I came into womanhood in many ways, guided by Carrie, Samantha, Miranda, and Charlotte. Relying on them to answer the questions, I was much too shy to ask, and I learned lessons from their mistakes. I coveted the outfits and dreamed of what life must be like in New York City for a group of single, self-assured, carefree women. As it happened, I made my own move to the Big Apple when I was a cool decade, uh, when I was a cool decade younger than the Sex in the City girls, firmly in a long-term relationship, and certainly without a core group of female peers whose disposable income and relationship status lent themselves to endless nights, sipping martinis and cruising the latest clubs. In short, my life in New York has been largely average. And I've learned, as anyone learns after they spend more than a week here, that the world of Carrie Bradshaw is only available to literal millionaires. And, that, and the fact that they pass her life off as doable on a second tier news uh, paper columnist wages is nothing short of criminal. As a writer living in the city, I can confirm that not even the most handsomely com compensated editor of some venture capitalist backed media startup could live Gary's life, let alone the person writing the 1998 equivalent of listicles about, about dicks. The sex in the city world was pure fantasy, no more attainable to the average woman than a Jane Austen novel. But that didn't matter and shouldn't. No matter what anyone says, and I firmly believe anyone who says this sort of thing hasn't really watched the show. Sex in the City was fucking awesome. It was awesome beyond anything we have seen on TV since, in my opinion. To see those four women flirting openly with the big 4-0, uh, refusing to settle or to depend entirely on a relationship for self-definition. The true love story, as we say, is the love among those women. And at many times, the men flitting in and out of their world were peri peripheral. It didn't matter if you adored Steve or hated Aiden or had a not so perfect appreciation for Trey. I may be alone in that last camp, but I also love the Russian. So I'm used to being yelled at for my opinions. What mattered is that you felt engrossed in these women's lives, stories, and personal happiness. When Samantha got diagnosed, you cried. When Charlotte put on that Elizabeth Taylor dress and made it to Brady's birthday, you yelled with joy. When Carrie had to uh, drag her scraggly ass into Big's office to ask for money to save her apartment, a record, uh, a record scratched. Hold up, girl, this is a little degrading you said, wondering why Carrie was consistently allowed to live a financial life not unlike a freshly caught fish, flailing and bouncing and gasping for oxygen on the wooden planks of an old trawler. Or maybe that was just me, but it really should be all of us. Because as the dust settles on the era of women's self-actualization, it's more important than ever that we start taking stock, not just of the romantic and sexual questions posed by the show, but also the financial ones. It's not enough that we just joke about how unaffordable that their lives were, how unrealistic the portrait of New York City was, or how much each character would have had to spend each year on purses and shoes alone. 
we have to start digging into the individual characters nuanced relationships to money and independence because it isn't enough to just be the kind of woman who always has a condom in her fendi we know now that one must have goals and dreams that involve things like investments and property ownership and retirement instead of just falling in love with your stumpy divorce lawyer and this is why no matter how aspirational her wardrobe or enviable some of her flings her character dated a young bradley cooper twice as two different people carrie is never the person we should be emulating nor is charlotte really as her long term financial strategy seemed to have been date rich dudes then date the rich dudes that helped me divorce those previous rich dudes it would be smarter to emulate samantha whose personal life may have been wild and unpredictable but whose professional and financial security were always for lack of a better better word tight you couldn't shame samantha because she had an iron grip over her own destiny and knew what she wanted if that meant blowing the ups guy in between closing six figure deals that's exactly what she was going to do on a tuesday but the person who feels in my opinion more aspirational for the tfdr is miranda it's taking it's taken me a long time to come around to the fact that i am mostly def most definitely a miranda if only because the wardrobe department seemed to hate her so very much but i am i am a miranda and i love it bucket hats and uh windbreakers and whatever sweaters and all i accept that i will be the one who runs out the door with mussed up red hair and a swipe of burnt umber lipstick ready to conquer the world i'll be the one who loves her job loves her friends but isn't afraid to tell them when they're being huge dicks and loves her life just the way it is if that means i don't get some puffy white wedding dress or lavish ceremony to show how much i love my significant other i am okay with it if i am going to delay my fairy tale ending to build some stability for myself so be it if i'm going to show up to brunch looking decidedly puffy sometimes because i spend the week eating oreos well that's just how it's going to be so embrace your inner miranda but maybe not the eating baked goods out of the trash part tfd readers are savvy practical and goal oriented and they are constantly striving to get better on an individual level they aren't afraid of brutal honesty when necessary and are just as happy to swap information on their credit score as they are to talk about the hookup they had in a broom closet at the portuguese embassy the night before so we're mirandas which is a wonderful thing to be when it came to money and love miranda didn't take any shit she would take her friends to task for their irresponsible financial choices put a hard line between her money and her partners until they committed and even then she took the lead on big decisions because she was the one equipped to make them money much like olive colored crew neck wool dresses was no fucking joke to miranda hobbs and it shouldn't be to us either especially when it comes to our relationships romantic or otherwise we should all strive to reach a level of openness compassion and serious personal boundaries when it comes to navigating money and love and realize that talking about money doesn't make us assholes not talking about money makes us idiots it's easy to have a vision of relationships floating along smoothly on some ethereal cloud of constant agreement and alignment but the truth is that almost never happens even if the two people in question are both mature open and respectful what happens when one of them has way more money than the other what happens when someone loses their job what happens when somebody needs to borrow something or someone doesn't pay the other person back there are a million things that can go wrong with money between two people and being uh squeamish about handling problems okay i'm not able to read that as they come up or um keeping the money conversation open and fluid only hurts you in the end and when it comes to friendships whether one on one or in a big social group a disparity in income or relationship to money can be difficult to overcome 
often in an effort to avoid any financial weirdness among friends, we avoid talking about money at all. Assuming that the mention of hard numbers or goals or backgrounds might alienate someone. Yet it's that very silence that stokes awkwardness and makes friends feel like they can't be honest with one another. Two friends with radically different incomes or spending habits aren't going to magically overcome that difference by ignoring it. The only way they can actually make it not that big of a deal is by confronting, confronting the issue head on and talking about it as openly as they would anything else. Socially and romantically, we know that conversation is the key to navigating differences and overcoming fears. But it can feel impossibly hard to be the one to start things off. What if we are the one who brings up salaries at brunch and suddenly seem like a vulgar, envious asshole? It shouldn't be risky to talk about these things. But it seems that even in our era of constant communication and oversharing, money remains a taboo that even the most otherwise open people refuse to really discuss. Over happy hour Prosecco, I asked my friend Anna Breslau, author and former cosmopolitan editor, what she thought about the whole, we'll talk about anything but money phenomenon. And she put it, I was a writer editor at Cosmo for over two years. So I saw a lot of questions about deep personal sh relationship shit. We had an attitude of no judgment, all topics are welcome. And somehow, even with that attitude, we almost never heard questions about money unless we specifically sought them out. It sounds crazy, but people are more open to talk about anal sex than money. It seems almost ridiculous comparison to make, but the ease with which many of us discuss the physical <clears throat> aspects of relationships only serves to highlight the restrictions we have about money talk. We feel comfortable saying women should demand orgasms, and yet we don't think or say women should demand their own separate emergency fund in a relationship. We can think of a million boundaries and standards that we should have when it comes to the emotional and sexual parts of love and yet be totally without those same standards for our finances. It sounds crazy, but people are more open to talking about this than money. I used to avoid the topic of money with friends and especially with boyfriends because I thought it vulgar at best and the stuff of excommunication at worst. And besides, I never thought I never brought anything to the relationship financially. So when it came to long term planning, I was pretty much at the whim of whomever I happened to be dating. It wasn't until I started talking about money regularly and being more conscious of how I handled mine that I realized I deserved that mutual level of respect and openness I sought to offer others. If I had a friend I could talk about literally everything with, yet never discuss numbers or goals because that was taboo, how close were we really? And if I was dating someone who wasn't willing to make financial planning a part of our life, where could our future actually go? Once I realized that talking about money is as much a part of a healthy relationship as talking about sex, or basically everything else people talk about when they care about each other, I got over the fear and dove right in over brunch with whatever friend I happened to be with. And this means that my close social circles have over the past few years become narrowed to the people with whom I can talk openly about money. That's a good thing. When you talk openly and honestly about money, you become more confident at work, more demanding of your own goals and habits and more aware of what is and isn't healthy. Talking about money with friends helped me negotiate a good salary and having a very financially open relationship with my partner allowed me to start my own business. Just like you'll have better sex by talking about it openly and asking questions, your financial life stands to be upgraded in the same way. When I first started looking into the psychology behind talking about money in relationships, one name kept coming up over and over, Olivia Mellon. Olivia is the founder of Money Harmony and a therapist and pioneer in the field of money conflict resolution. 
She's written or co-written five books on the topic and defines so much common knowledge and finance and relationships that she even has laws of money communication colloquially named after her. Her theories on navigating friendships and romantic relationships through the prism of financial health are simple, practical, and applicable to nearly everyone. And luckily for us, she was kind enough to sit down for a Q&A for this book. Here are her biggest and most important ideas on communication, independence, and when to call it a day. Olivia Mellon. What are the biggest problems you see in relationships when it comes to money? Generally speaking, the two biggest issues you tend to see are when a money spender is dating or married to a money hoarder and a money warrior, warrior is married to a money avoider. And often, as you can imagine, these personality types tend to go hand in hand. And this polarization is extremely common. I've been talk talking couples polarization patterns around money and other areas for so long that people have started calling in Mellon's law, which is if opposites don't attract off the bat, which they usually do, then they will create each other eventually. This is a huge phenomenon in financial relationships that these inherently different personality types drive one another and become more pronounced over time. So even if two spenders get together, they'll fight each other for the super spender and the other will begin to save by comparison. And speaking generally, it's only in balancing these differences and moving toward the middle that you can have a happy partnership. Question, why do so many couples break up or divorce over money in your opinion? Over the past 30 years, money has been either the number one or number two cause of divorce in America. It's primarily because for most people, money is never just money. Money represents pa love, power, security, control, self-worth, self-esteem, freedom, and happiness. And so as long as money is an emotionally loaded symbol, people can't make rational decisions about it. So that is why I teach my version of Harville Hendricks mirroring exercise. Step one, mirroring. Playing back what the speaker said as close to a verbatim as possible. Second step, validation. Seeing what makes sense about your, what your partner said from his or her perspective. And step three, empathy. I imagine you might also be feeling dash and dash. To truly enter your partner's world, you have to treat talking about money as compassionately and empathetically as you were talking about any emotional topic because for most of us, money is emotionally loaded. Question, aside from constant and empathetic communication, what would you say is the most important strategy for navigating money in relationships? All women need some separate money. All women need some separate money. All women need some separate money. And yes, I need to repeat it three times because it's so crucial. And I say that because women's main challenge in relationships, I'm generalizing here, even financially, is over giving and losing themselves in relationships. Most women learn to give themselves over entirely to the new identity and role as part of a couple. So I believe that keeping some separate money is a tangible, important symbol of some self that does not disappear in the relationship. On the other hand, Many men who want to merge the money in relationship reflect their biggest challenge, learning how to merge. Since often men have a hard time getting connected and staying connected, merging money is one way to lovingly express their desire for intimacy. Question, and for friends, what are the biggest money conflicts? Really, there are two, very different financial status and borrowing or lending money between friends. Now, that's not to say that this can't be overcome. It can. Two people from very different financial backgrounds can have a wonderful friendship, but they have to address that difference explicitly. They have to acknowledge their difference and communicate it openly because trying to pretend like it doesn't exist will only result in discomfort and conflicting needs. Empathetic communication is crucial in friendship as well as in primary relationships. 
Okay, let's just read the last question. But does that mean that lending money between friends is always a bad idea? As in, if you are two friends with seriously different incomes, should the friend with a lot more money never offer to help them out financially? My honest view is that you can, and sometimes you should. But the truth is that if you are lending money to someone in your life, you have to be comfortable with viewing that money as a gift. If you actually want to see that money back in full and in a timely fashion, you, should not, you shouldn't do it because that's where relationships can get impaired or even destroyed. So I'm going to pause here. Okay. What do you think of this chapter so far, guys? What are you getting for yourself? Anyone? Are you enjoying this chapter? Did you enjoy this chapter? Okay. So what about this chapter are you loving so far? I'm like, now we're talking. <laughs> hmm. Makes sense. It makes perfect sense. <laughs> really. I mean, relationships will break only if you expect something that they don't do. So, especially the last part, if, if you let the money come in into a relationship, then you should allow it to just be given. If you expect it back, if things don't let, don't lend money within close friends and stuff. I mean, between friends, money is the thing that can break the easiest. There are, of course, other things. But if you're clear and your communication is clear, then remember you can gift it. You'll also feel better about yourself and that expectation is not there in the relationship doesn't make it right. Mm. Yeah. And I, but I think, you know, uh, something that she has not talked about mentioned it is how to say no and it keeps coming again and again right I, how does I, guess you, say no? I guess you take the ownership and change the equation and if you have the, the understanding with your partner things will work after some time you have to take the ownership to change the equation of this disbalance of the partners and maybe it can start with women saying that, you know, women need separate money over, of their own, you know. Yeah, we have to stand okay. for ourselves. That's the first step. And we don't tend to do that. That's why we are lagging behind. Yeah. Most of us, I'll say. Yeah. We feel what? bad about asking what we want most of the times. Yeah. yeah. No, no. Like, I think that's why a lot of relationships do work is because I think that's clear from the start that money is mine, your money is yours. We can have our money in the middle, but that is my money is all yours. It, it, it should not be. You fell in with someone with a separate identity. Keep that separate identity. Don't become, merge yourself into a shadow. In, just, just in money and everything. Yeah, just that it is really difficult to again get to that point where my money is my money, your money is your money, you know. I mean, we listen to many conversations. I think, you know, they should not put these messages like uh, women should have their separate money uh, in the pages of such books because number one, uh, mostly, uh, mostly women who don't think, think on this line, there are many women who haven't thought on this. Line. I mean, we, we came to this pain really late, right? A lot of oh, us yeah. came to this pain. They should not have this line in a chapter, in a book somewhere where women wouldn't reach, they should be broadcasted somewhere else. You know, the women need to have different money. We need to do that. We've yeah. got it from the book and now we need to broadcast it. Yes, yes. Because our women yeah. are getting in the book, you know, so so we have to be, keep, we have to keep telling. <laughs> Women I need think to right from the start of a relationship you maintain that separateness because it shouldn't become a conversation later saying after you've merged the money to say oh no I want to keep my money separate if, yeah. when you meet each other your money is not the same when you meet each other for the first time you have your money they have their money it's not just a romantic relationship even among friends or family or anything you start off with something of your own don't get into a situation where you start merging it. 
I mean, my husband and I have taken it to another step. Some of our favorite books, we have separate, separate copies. So, <laughs> so that's another thing. <laughs> it's not just this. Because we already had these copies. And I said, I'm not giving up my copy. And he said, I'm not giving up my copy. So we have two copies at home. And mine's mine and his is his. That's there. Everybody's so, happy. This is how it goes. Yeah. And not to worry. We, I mean, it's not like we don't fight. But we've had touch wood. Pretty good 24 years of marriage so far. So... Guys, this is a secret. Buying separate copies is a secret. Um, but so then again, as a family, you are spending more money on the copies. <laughs> no, but we already had the books. <laughs> yeah, as a family, we spend a lot on books. <laughs> Both of us read a lot. Our children also read a lot. And new authors that we didn't have in our childhood, our children had. So they introduced us to those authors. So we used to get from the library and read it. But if you like the book, you want to own it. So you also buy a copy then after that. The books you don't like, you don't buy. Yeah. But you have it on the Kindle, but you also buy a copy because you want. My house, if I should take you for a tour around the house, there's hardly any wall space. This is probably one of the few blank walls. Everything has bookshelves. So this is how it is. Yeah, got it. So... I think, you know, uh, talking about money among friends um, and, and this is one of the favorite topics, my one of my favorite topics, because, you know, we need to have more of such conversations, but it's never the easiest way. There's no easy way to do it, I think, you know. Um, so how do we do it and how are you guys doing it? What's the way to take it forward to help more women really align to this thought that you know you need money of your own yeah uh, just just to you know there are people we have conversations with and then there are women who are really closer to the retirement age and uh, they feel that one crore is enough right and they are retiring in some time and how now through the work that we do, we can we have begun to see that hey, one crore may not be enough, right? It will it will be good enough for some time. Um, and then there are young women. I think one of the things is that before your marriage, get financially educated. I mean, pick up this skill. You know, if you're picking up other skills as well before you get married, definitely pick this skill up to every woman. You know, I mean that's. Uh, yeah, personally, I would like to see really women by 25, they're financially educated, financially smart. When will we get there? That's the question. Yeah. Women on Wealth has made the start. We're doing it. We're doing it little by little. Things like this don't happen overnight. But every time we talk to one more woman, it has puts that seed in their head. Go out and talk. Usha, Renu, Aditi, Athira, Anjali, Sneha, Avni. Anything for you guys that you're getting from the book? Uh, Sheetal, I just joined. Uh, no. <laughs> so okay. didn't really heard. I mean, read okay. the book. So, yes, so. you must read this chapter. Chapter but, number six. Yeah. Really lovely. <laughs> Got that. Thank you. What but about one thing that women should learn is that, like, or my, I mean, my experience was that, like, I was so, you know, honest to my partner, saying, uh, uh, even though whatever I'm earning, everything I was like transparent. But uh, same thing, not uh, not there on the other side because he was having uh, other, uh, you know, commitments for mm -hmm. his brother or whatever which i was which was not coming to my notice so those were key, some key things like th those were some situations where i used to get hurt but now it's like once i'm i got financial clarity and i'm trying to do my own things all these pressures have been you know are reduced i mean i can build my own wealth uh, is is the main thing that i learned from women on wealth mm. Wow. Thank you for saying that. I, I think, you know, from picking up from what you were, you know, where you left, Usha, uh, yeah. perhaps it's also about 
there there was this um, because we are partners so there is some dependency on you in building the life that i see for us right and where when we see that other person has responsibilities or commitments then how it impacts us right um yeah thank you for sharing it's not it's not that he is he is doing that after marriage the things were there since uh, like 15 20 15 years like that so which i i can't change uh, over time right it's like people got used to it or he got used to it mm. for helping others and all which is not in my hand but i was so transparent transparent from my side like if i am doing some help to my uh, you know my sister and you know, i was so transparent and mm. things are like that <laughs> but yeah it's important to, to have some relationship with money too <laughs> yes thank you okay uh i'm now going to invite everybody to share what you guys are taking from today's book reading and are you going to pick up this book now please do share it's a pretty light book if you look at it and with some pretty images as well it's light so there is a gap ज but how easy was it for you guys to not to expect because this is like hard earned money i know like if it is a small gift or anything it's fine if you are gifting for birthday or marriage anniversary but then if you are giving in a bulk like lakhs like how easy <laughs> how easy <laughs> you should know your limit how much i want to give or how much i'm comfortable giving that limit you should know for yourself exactly it matters yeah i mean if you cannot afford to write it off and you cannot afford to then don't give it learn to say no and not give it if you are giving it then you don't expect it back you might tell them yes please this is a loan and if they give it back it's a bonus but learn mentally to write it off if you cannot i never get it out, okay but somewhere i feel Learning like to uh, say no is very important thing very important thing how to say no in a hmm. nice way that's very important yeah but other other thing i learned is like indirectly we are making them incapable to think to you know to put efforts and all that Yeah. so one thing i implemented in my sister's case was like i used to help her frequently now that i am asking her to you know build your own thing uh, like put efforts and uh, make sure you earn that much money so i, I understand like if it is emergency situation definitely we will we'll have to put our humanity in front but then uh, for frequent help and all i don't think it works <laughs> and and in relationships we um we tend to not see it that we see it as help contribution uh but then uh, all that contribution support help you know uh, is that creating more dependency right and sometimes we it's not we it's not in our awareness is what i'm also getting present and i think there are stages and many conversations that's led us to uh, this point where we can see it clearly now and then also as we are working on our money life then we are also able to articulate it and this is what you know when women tell us that i don't have the money to do your to the courses or i don't have the money right but this is how money becomes available to you when you start working on your money life because then you are able to set boundaries you know what is mine what i need to build you know and when you don't didn't have clarity with you didn't have goals how much money you saved didn't matter maybe as much you know but when you start working on your money life money shows up because money is going coming and going otherwise you know so 
Not yeah. So, so I used to think like, say, if I'm earning one lakh, I used to think like, it's okay, five thousand or ten thousand, it's okay for a sister to spend. Then, uh, like after joining the course, I started thinking in terms of SIP. Oh, this SIP also matters. <laughs> <laughs> Wow, yes. Usha's really grown fast, Usha. Right. Yes, yes. Lending, lending in SIP, so ultimately that's also compounding. Mm. Absolutely. And I think uh, from what Usha shared, what I uh, get is, you know, how we need to ensure as wealth creators, and I think as individuals also, to help each person live their fullest, help each person become independent, you know, Yes. independence for every individual okay so yeah that other thing is like price. yeah in with, with my expenses also i was like that it's okay i'm earning let me spend 5000 for myself let me go go for a spa let me buy a dress <laughs> but now i am everything relating to sip i'm i'm even like next month i have a no house ceremony planned but i'm thinking to buy one sari so should see yeah <laughs> don't swing the other extreme once in a while it's good to invest in yourself yeah. your mental well-being is also important so if it's going to end up you feel better at some point do spend on yourself as well once in a while and similarly when someone asks you for money whether it's five thousand or five lakhs first question should be why do you need it and is there some way that you could earn it is there some way you can serve, save up for it? Help them build those skills before you say, sure, it's only 5,000. Yeah. It depends on what, what. Yeah. And then the last bit is what you allow will continue. Okay. So on that note, we shall close here. Thank you so much, everyone. Keep reading this book and keep sharing. So we'll take this book and then uh, we'll take this chapter for this week and help everybody catch up as well. Uh, and keep sharing your insights, okay? Thank you so much. Have a lovely weekend, guys. See you. Thank you all. Bye-bye.